Hello, everyone. Welcome to what's new on Amazon Workspaces, AppStream, and Workspaces Web. Thank you for taking the time out from your busy reInvent schedule. And what an incredible reInvent first day has been. Tons and tons of new launches for many of our different customers. Um, a lot of new services, lots of new features. I understand that this session is probably the last thing, standing between your evening festivities. Um, but I'm going to make sure that we're going to have a lot of good content. We're going to announce a, a lot of new features on end user computing um, and get everybody energized for you know, continuing all of those and, um, evening festivities. My name is Hassan. Uh, I lead a product management at AWS End User Computing Services. Uh, with me today on stage, we have Ray Wang, who's a principal product manager at EUC as well. And then we have Wiley, who's the SVP of information technology at one of our biggest customer, Maximus. So today we are going to speak a little bit about um, what are some of the insights or tenants that we use uh, to deliver maximum customer value when we think about end user computing. Whether it is to support customers different or changing business needs, whether it is to support uh, you know, the ever-changing and dynamic global workspace, um, and a lot of how we think about delivering the best customer experiences. Um, in addition to that, we're gonna today talk about how we innovate, how do we iteratively build features and new services in end user computing. Um, then we're gonna go right into our new announcements. We have, as I mentioned, tons of new uh, features that we're launching, um, as well as we're gonna go a little bit into the details of those features. And at the very end, last but not least, Wiley is going to speak about his journey uh, with end user computing. Uh, we have a lot of QR codes today on the slides <laughs> to show you some of the announcements and blog posts. So uh, please get your cameras ready whenever they come. Um, in part of our announcement today is going to focus on uh, one of our partner, Canonical. Uh, so Kuram here, who's um, uh, one of my favorite partners from Canonical, uh, is going to be here later uh, in this evening to answer any of your questions because we are going to talk about Ubuntu today. So let's dive in. When we think about end user computing, we, are, um, we have this shared goal with our customers. And one of the best part about AWS is we don't build our features or functionalities in silos. We carefully listen to our customers. We understand their business needs and then we work together very closely with them, almost to a partnership level, to even define what that feature should look like, or define what the services should look like. And our customers, uh, especially when they're talking about uh, enabling workforce and a workplace, they tell us some things very frequently. And those are the things that we use to really define how we are going to approach our service build up. First thing that they always tell us is flexibility. What they want to do is whenever there's new workforce, when new employees joining, you know, old employees leaving, they want to be very agile. They want to be flexible when they're using their workloads on AWS. So first tenant that we uh, focus on is how do we deliver the most flexibility to our customers, whether it is cost optimization, whether it is uh, you know, making the IT agile, or something else. The second thing we hear from our customers repeatedly is they want choice. They want all sorts of operating systems, all sorts of application support, all sorts of device compatibility and whatnot. So um, we focus a lot on building our service to enable choice for our customers. And then finally, um, customer experience. That one is kind of a given. But essentially, um, we focus on both our admin user as well as the end user. Because ultimately, we and our customers have a joint goal to make our end user's life easy, but in a secure way. And also in a way where they can be uh, highly productive. 
So how does AWS help, and specifically end user computing? How do we help? Um, the first piece is where we focus on productivity. But it's not just about the productivity of the end user. We care about how fast admins can scale up their infrastructure. We care about do, does admin has all the tools to work with in order to enable their end, user, uh, uh, end users. Uh, one of the line I use um, is that with the cloud media, with the cloud uh, desktop as a service or applications, uh, or whether it's streaming protocols, we want to deliver more features than are available in a physical world. However, we want to deliver equal or better experience to the end user uh, compared to when they're using their you know, old laptops or physical hardware. So that's really the essence of how uh, we think about it in end user computing services where uh, we focus on, hey admins, how can you scale your things faster? How you can easily manage your infrastructure? Um, then once we talk about the end user um, productivity, I think it's uh, well known and given that um, nobody wants downtimes because that impacts productivity, that impacts businesses. So um, one of the things we focus on resiliency quite a bit, and today we has, have an announcement on, on that subject actually. Um, then if we talk about security, which is the number one priority at AWS, um, how do we think about protecting the data, both at rest as well as in transit? How do we provide conditional or at time access uh, to the customers or to the end users? So they can get their job done, but at the same time, the data is fully secure. And finally, we uh, in AWS provide uh, cost optimization features. How do you op continuously optimize your infrastructure? Um, one of the recent example of that, um, which Wiley is going to talk about later, is uh, the pandemic. When COVID happened, everybody had to go virtual. So a lot of demand to grow the infrastructure fast. Um, now as things are settling down, uh, people are looking to optimize their infrastructure in a way that some people will remain virtual, some people will do both virtual as well as in person, some people will go to in person. So there's a continuous um, need for all the different businesses to uh, optimize their costs. So that's really uh, how AWS uh, enables our customers, especially IT organizations. When we talk a little bit about the uh, choice, we look at many different uh, areas where we focus on. However, the main focus of our, uh, uh, in terms of choice, is we want to meet customers where they are. Whether you're a customer who want to leverage your existing on-premises solution, build something on top of it, um, whether you want to build your own cloud desktop service or application streaming service, whether you want fully managed services where they are, we do all the heavy lifting and uh, you just focus on enabling the end users. So we have a little bit of everything for everyone. <laughs> so uh, that's why we have a big portfolio of uh, end user computing services in AWS at this point. Um, we have DCV, which is the streaming protocol, uh, we have Amazon Workspaces, which is the fully uh, managed desktop service. Um, we have AppStream, which provides application streaming as well as um, selective persistence when we talk about desktops. Um, and here, the selective persistence model is, um, you know, AppStream, you can take user data as well as application settings, persist them in S3 buckets. Uh, but your machine can be ramped up and be turned off um, based on the usage pattern of the end users. Then we have Workspaces Core, which we're going to talk about today, which uh, provides customers as well as partners to build their own customized VDI solutions on top of our services. So a lot of customization that, that they can do. Um, and today we are going to talk about protocols uh, quite a bit. So uh, let's dive right in. Um, when we look at each of these family of services in end-user computing, 
we have a, a, a mental model which we use to innovate across these services. Some of these things I already described, but essentially um, we want to focus on agility, making the IT agile. Um, think about how many uh, employees join in a big organization uh, any given day and some who leave. Um, many companies and many IT organizations face a big hurdle in terms of reclaiming their IT equipment uh, once people leave. So uh, that's really where we focus on agility. Similarly, we tr we're trying, uh, talking about the uh, cost optimization of even using your uh, uh, workload in the cloud. How do we scale up fast? How do we ramp down fast? Um, productivity is uh, essentially the end goal for both us and our customers. Uh, we talked a little bit about security, how critical it is. It's not just the security of the data, it's access as well. It is also compliance. How do we make sure that our services are HIPAA compliant? So if you are a customer who operates in the healthcare industry, um, you can be comfortable that you know, our services are fully uh, compliant with those um, compliance boundaries. Um, then reliability. Uh, nobody ever wants to use services that are not reliable, that uh, fail when, um, when the time is important. So uh, we have a tremendous amount of focus on reliability. Uh, especially we are uh, the only cloud provider which provide a commitment of 99.9% uh, SLA, which is financially backed, meaning we, we give customers money if it was our fault uh, that there was a productivity impact. Um, and finally, pay-as-you-go pricing, um, many different pricing models we have available on different uh, services, um, both uh, fixed-rate pricing as well as usage-based pricing uh, to really make sure that you have clear visibility into your budgeting as well as predictability. So let's talk about workspaces. Um, as we discussed, we want to enable uh, as much choice for our customers as possible. Um, since workspaces is a desktop service, uh, one of the key pieces that we focus on is operating system. So uh, we have already been offering uh, Microsoft Windows. We have been offering Amazon Linux for a while. Um, and recently, we launched Ubuntu on workspaces. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Ubuntu today. So why did we think about Ubuntu, first of all? Um, we look at customers uh, and users come in different shapes in terms of their workload. They have different needs. We can talk about office workers. We can think about developers. We can think about task workers, call centers, business process operators, and whatnot. So, we have heard from our customers a lot that, hey, you know, our developers really, really want uh, Ubuntu because uh, it's a well-known operating system that they are very used to. A lot of their apps are already supported in that operating system. Um, so we thought about bringing Ubuntu to workspaces. And the core goal for that was we want to leverage the same existing features and benefits that we just uh, discussed to Ubuntu as well, to developers. I'll give a story here where uh, my first job was as a developer, that was a while ago. Um, and it took me one week just to set up my infrastructure, just to set up my uh, developer environment. Uh, sure, the company was uh, paying me for just doing my setup, but at the same time, I was incredibly frustrated because I had to read so many different um, uh, you know, help manuals and articles to figure out what is the right setting so I can actually start coding. Um, but with Ubuntu desktops for workspaces, what customers can do is they can build their same consistent uh, dev environment that they need for their companies, pack the right tools in it, whether it's Eclipse IDE, whether it's Atom or whatever you have, um, whether you want to run uh, Docker containers on it, or pack it in it, and now every new developer that onboards gets a workspace with Ubuntu in 20 minutes. So that's the ramp up time. We have essentially shortened that full one week into 20 minutes. Um, we're going to talk about SAML 2 as well today because that's one of the announcements. Um, but a couple of things I wanted to mention here, uh, especially in terms of um, management. One of the problems that has been um, 
quite frequently occurring in the world uh, of IT is, hey, how do I manage my two different type of operating systems? I have Linux, I have uh, Windows as well. So how do I uh, figure out how I can consistently manage it? And yes, I don't want to learn a new tool. Um, so uh, Canonical here um, has been working to uh, launch GPO-based um, administration and management of Ubuntu desktops. And that is one of the best things that customers have liked uh, recently in our discussions where they have one uh, active directory that is managing Windows and the same one is also able to manage the Ubuntu um, active directory or Ubuntu desktops. Um, just like our other Linux offerings, uh, Ubuntu also comes prepackaged with AWS CLI, AWS SDK. So um, if, if you, uh, chances are that you're uh, developing on AWS, so um, all of those things are already there, prepackaged. Pre and um, a, a best uh, use of, uh, you know, Docker containers comes for some of our customers where uh, they look at um, they, they do all of their coding in Docker environments. So uh, they abstract a bunch of uh, things from um, the underlying desktop. Um, and that's the consistency of the environment that uh, I'm talking about. And there's much more configurations and customizations you can do. So we talked a lot about developers, but Ubuntu is not necessarily restricted to developers or limited to developers. Uh, a lot of our customers are using it for data scientist users. They're using it for engineers. Uh, some are even using it for task workers where uh, all the task worker has to do is have calendaring and uh, you know, clock and things like that, but have a lot of usage on the web application or have Linux-based application uh, that their enterprises use. So uh, there's a broad variety of uh, use cases that uh, our customers use these desktops for. Uh, but again, ultimately the goal is that uh, IT uh, admins are able to take one service or a collection of services in this case um, and enable all sorts of different type of users. So once we developed uh, Ubuntu, we actually, uh, in typical AWS fashion, we uh, shared a lot of these desktops with our internal developers, see what they're liking and what they're not liking. So this is some of the things that they told us uh, on, a, uh, on a repeated basis, so some of the things that I've discussed uh, before as well, um, which is related to that, hey, this, uh, this provides me a common platform where I can work with, uh, I don't have to um, worry about all the configurations, it's easy, easy to use, uh, comes with five um, year LTS, and in this case, we all, uh, Canonical also provides five additional years, a total 10 years of patching support, um, a global community of developers uh, on Ubuntu, um, and a lot of engagement with the open source community. Uh, some of the customers are even moving from Windows to Ubuntu because uh, there's no licensing fees, they have existing tools and applications that are already, uh, you know, very well optimized for Ubuntu, so that makes it easier. And some of the customers are moving from uh, WSL, which is the Windows subsystem for Linux, to Ubuntu um, because we have the uh, support for Docker container. So, uh, without further ado, Ubuntu is available today. Uh, it's available in all regions where uh, Workspaces is available in. Uh, There's the QR, first QR code I was talking about. So that's our uh, launch blog for Ubuntu. Um, and uh, it's ready on the console. You can go and launch and start using. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about is Workspaces Core. So Workspaces Core allows our customers uh, to customize, uh, or customers and partners to build a customized solution um, on Workspaces. Why is it so? Why is that so uh, cool thing? I think the most important thing is we are abstracting the infrastructure management layer from all of these partners and customers. Um, we uh, actually launched this uh, like a month ago with um, our partner VMware, uh, who's gonna be the first one uh, to leverage this uh, functionality. Um, but how it works is that the third party, or in this case VMware or any other partner, 
they build their own control plane, they build their own client, which goes to the end user, but under the hood, it's all workspaces infrastructure running. And the benefit to the partner is, okay, now they don't have to go uh, do the whole build of infrastructure code, as well as continuously manage it. So that's the very cool thing. Um, here's a little slide about how Workspace's core architecture works. Um, I'm not gonna necessarily go into too much detail on this, um, but the concept is the same. You, uh, for a partner um, to build their own customized solution on VDI, they leverage the Workspace's core product, uh, comes with the same pricing, op uh, similar pricing options, um, and they can build their own solution on top of it, uh, you know, private label it and whatnot. Uh, another thing we launched recently last week actually was the SAML 2.0, Certificate-Based Authentication. Um, one of the reasons that I really love this feature is because it really puts the end user at the center of end user computing. So earlier I said that um, we want to deliver the end user a native experience uh, similar to what they get on a local device or better um, in a secure way. So what SAML does is it's, it's not just helping the end user, but also the admin user to centralize the management. Um, the key feature for SAML here is you can use their existing IDPs. You can continue to use the Active Directory setup that you already have. Um, integrate them, sync them, and then provide your users access using SAML-based authentication towards workspaces. And the icing on the cake here is that, imagine you have a user that uh, is mainly working in a workspace, but sometimes need access to this secure system that you don't want to give permanent access to. So the concept of uh, time-based or conditional access comes into play. Where I'm going with this is the same SAML federation you can use to give this user a workspace and access to AppStream, uh, where you have the secure website access, access to Workspaces Web, where there might be a certain secure website there they can go do their job. Um, so it really brings the whole uh, picture together where the end user is using the same exact credentials that they can go access these different uh, systems. Two more. QR codes. <laughs> Hopefully I didn't miss that. <laughs> but uh, those two announcements, one is for AppStream and one is for workspaces. Um, so like I mentioned, this really um, makes use of the same user identities and auth. Um, and finally, I wanted to share uh, today's announcement before I hand it over to Ray is the biggest problem that we have heard in the cloud of virtual world is a better video experience, uh, conference experience. Um, again, repeating myself, we <laughs> want to give the end user a native-like or better uh, experience than they get with their physical devices. So we partnered with Zoom and we built uh, this functionality where uh, Zoom AV is routed outside of the workspace's streaming channel with the goal that the end user sees a, as simple and as easy experience of video conferencing as they have been used to with their physical device. And with that, I'm going to um, hand over to Ray, um, but uh, just a couple of quick slides here about Workspaces Web. Um, in Workspaces Web, it, it's, it's a service that we launched a year ago, um, and for, those of who, you who don't know about Workspaces Web, it is a secure browser to provide your end users. Um, on Workspaces Web, we have the similar functionality that we talk about with um, AppStream and Workspaces, uh, but essentially the, the difference is that now you can really laser focus on some of your task workers. Uh, one of our task workers within AWS is um, uh, call center agents because they are mostly using our internal web application for call centers where they go, they do ticket management, they take calls. Um, and with Workspaces Web, what happens is that customers can take that simple browser, uh, which is fully secure, apply policies to it, and it is at a very affordable rate. 
So uh, one of the key feature of Workspaces Web is many users can't, uh, don't need a full desktop, and a workspace minimum one is uh, costing about $35. But with Workspaces Web, we have uh, $7 a month per user flat rate. So uh, super powerful for uh, some of our task worker scenarios. And now for real, passing over to Ray. Thank you, Hassan. All right. So today, I'd like to share the latest developments, uh, latest improvements that we have made to Workspace's streaming protocol, aka WSP. Uh, but before I talk about the specific improvements, I'd like to briefly uh, talk about what is a remote display protocol and to give you a little quick recap on WSP. Uh, so a remote display protocol is actually one of the uh, key fundamental technologies that enables Amazon Workspaces to provide the fully managed, high performance uh, remote desktop experience. So the works, the, for a remote display protocol, we have a host agent that sits on the host server. In this case, it's inside the Amazon Workspace. An Amazon workspace. And depending on factors such as you know, perf uh, network performance, CPU and GPU characteristics, or um, uh, actual the, the content that's being streamed, uh, the remote display protocol will intelligently use a combination, picks the optimal combination of codecs and captures the, 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 the a rendering of the desktop and then stream it uh, as pixels to the end user's devices. So no file is downloaded or uploaded, it's super secure. And the remote display protocol actually uh, also is very important to enable, uh, to support the different operating systems that Workspaces offers, in addition to all the in-session features like copy and paste, USB devices, if you want to use USB devices in session, or even like printing from the remote session. All the in session features that you can think of. So given that a remote dis display protocol is so important, Amazon Workspaces launched WSP two years ago. Uh, and to enable additional functionalities such as two-way audio and video conferencing, and also uh, the use of smart cards. So, Although we had uh, many customers that really loved the, these new features that WSP introduced, we also heard uh, some feedback on the performance and uh, you know, streaming quality. So as a result, over the past year, we actually have uh, under, uh, went through a complete overhaul of the WSP uh, streaming technology. So all of this is, uh, is uh, all the WSP uh, improvements is made possible by something called, called the DCV, which is a, a, another AWS-owned remote display protocol uh, that is used by many other AWS services such as Amazon AppStream and Amazon Nimble Studio. DCV is also trusted by many AWS customers like Nef uh, Netflix and Volkswagen. All right, so now going back to the uh, specific improvements that uh, we made to WSP. So our top one and two priorities uh, for this overhaul are you know, performance and then features. So for performance, performance-wise, we have implemented a couple of different uh, improvements. First of all, we implemented something called end-to-end -end UDP connection, which will enable uh, a near real-time responsiveness regardless of the network conditions. Uh, this enables your users to work anywhere, uh, anywhere. Uh, second, we also improved the overall performance of two-way audio and video calls, so that now that you, customers and partners can collaborate uh, seamlessly around uh, the globe without any issue. And lastly, we really lowered the uh, resource consumptions on things such as memory usage and also network bandwidth. So this way that uh, 
now your users get more uh, resources to run their own applications on workspaces. Also, it lessens the network uh, load. In addition to the performance improvements, we also launched a couple of new features. Uh, so for example, we announced support of uh, WSP 2.0 support for Ubuntu workspaces, like Hassan discussed. So now that IP admins can launch a provision and scale uh, Ubuntu workspaces for their data scientists, developers, and engineers. In addition, WSP 2.0 now adds support for workspaces Windows native client, Mac native client, and also the workspaces web client, aka web access. And speaking of web access, we really significantly improved the web access experience uh, in the last couple of months. So now you can get very cool features like you can have a video or audio conferencing call all within your web browsers without the users having to download any native client or uh, an, an upgrade, right? Um, and we also added uh, many usability improvements. Overall, we, we uh, launched seven new improvements for the web client. So to summarize, right, uh, as you can see, we have really uh, WSP is uh, it's a relatively young protocol compared with many other protocols on the market, but we have really taken on a lot of bold technology decisions to improve the performance and feature set. And going forward, we're very excited for the future for WSP in 2023 and beyond. Right? We have plans to add more client and server platform support. We have plans to expand WSP into more AWS region. And most importantly, we want to uh, enable more highly requested in-session features such as YubiKeys uh, in the future. Uh, in, if you want to try out WSP, you can simply launch a new workspaces using one of the WSP bundles. Or if you already uh, have a WSP workspace, all you need to do is to reboot to get uh, the host agent upgraded to 2.0. And lastly, you know, after you've tested WSP, if you really want to convert your PC or IP workspaces to WSP, we offer, also offer an API to help you do that. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. Handing it over to Hassan. Thank you, Ray. Um, so one of the biggest announcement I wanted to talk about today is related to reliability and resiliency. So as I was mentioning earlier, um, a break in end user productivity is really harmful, both to our customers and to us. So um, our focus for a while has been to, how do we enable our customers to continue to keep their end users productive? regardless of when there's uh, outages or systematic issues are happening. So similar to, uh, as I was describing, in AWS we partnered with our customers to uh, figure out how we're gonna build this feature. On this one we partnered with uh, Maximus and with Wiley here uh, to really understand how do we think about this feature. So some things that come across. One is uh, the productivity, uh, you know, maintaining the productivity despite any outages or despite any system failures. Second is we always talk about, hey, I can create an active and backup region and I can create these active backup uh, systems, but now I have to pay for both systems at all times. And that really uh, starts creating a, a cost problem where uh, you might have uh, an issue once per year, uh, but you're paying for both those infrastructures throughout the year. And finally, the administration of these two systems, like how do we keep the images in sync, how do we keep the user settings and all of that in sync, uh, becomes really painful. So um, we came up with the idea of uh, uh, Amazon Workspace's multi-region resiliency. So this is a feature uh, uh, which is a pretty massive feature in terms of both uh, development and, and the uh, work that it took us to, um, uh, to enable it. Um, we launched it last week and really the focus has been how do we 
um, make sure that there's an outage, there's an issue in one side of the system. How do we make sure the user can get access to their work and continue their work uh, within 30 minutes? We set a, a time for us that we're going to achieve it in 30 minutes. Um, so that's what Workspace's uh, multi-region resiliency does. And in typical Amazon fashion, we uh, create an abbreviation for this feature. So it's called MRR, <laughs> which I'm going to use in the next uh, slides. Um, it is cost effective in the sense that uh, we uh, only charge the customers for uh, their actual usage of the infrastructure. So the main region, whenever there's workspace running, you're uh, uh, you know, getting charged or uh, paying for the main usage, um, and there's no outage, um, you're essentially keeping an image in the backup region and keeping it just the image synced. And an outage happens, that's when the instances start firing up in the backup region. And again, you only pay for when the instances are being used um, by your end users. Um, some of the key things I wanted to talk about, how, how does this work, right? Um, so the MRR essentially works uh, with an active backup region model, um, with the active region having your active users at all time, um, and the backup region having the image being synced, the golden image with your company, um, uh, you know, profile settings, tools, uh, and whatnot in the backup region. Um, and for the end user, instead of them using a regionalized uh, registration code that they use today, where, uh, uh, you know, the workspaces registration code that they use today, um, a new global registration code is created that uh, the end users use on the workspace. Um, and for admins, what they do is that they set up networking because we need to make sure that we know where to route the end user to in the backup region in case of any issues. And once this setup is done, it's, it's quite simple, straightforward setup. Once this setup is done, um, anytime there's an issue on the main region, the user, uh, all they have to do is click reconnect and they're routed to the second region um, like magic. And uh, uh, we actually have um, a talk from the general manager of end user computing tomorrow, um, who's going to, Munir Mirza is his name, he's going to do a demo of this feature live. So um, if, if you haven't already signed up, please do sign up and go check it out. Um, another QR code here, uh, because this uh, QR code sh uh, shows you the announcement for the uh, multi-region resiliency feature, as well as uh, goes into all the details, what you need to know, what are the best practices, how you can uh, deploy the multi-region resiliency architecture um, in, a, in, the, in the best practices way. Um, as I mentioned, that Maximus was one of our biggest partner customer who um, helped us build this feature, who uh, built a better understanding of what their business needs are. So without further ado, I would like to invite Wiley to the stage, who's going to speak about his experience at Maximus with end user computing, as well as with the MRR architecture. Thank you, Hassan. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight, and thanks for letting me take a few moments to share our story uh, w about how Maximus partnered with the Amazon Workspaces team uh, to, to meet some real business needs that I think not just Maximus experienced, but all of you and most of the world. Maximus is a global provider of transformative technology services, digitally enabled customer experiences, and clinical health services that change people's lives. Our global employee count of approximately 53,000 uh, allows us to engage residents in 10 countries uh, and one of our primary focus areas is to uh, one of our primary focus areas is to help residents gain access to needed services at a federal, state, and local level, such as healthcare for children and adults, education and employment services, veteran services, and much more. As of month end October 2022, Maximus has processed 300 million call minutes by our contact center agents. In 2021, with the addition of the COVID and vaccine related volumes, we processed 886 million call minutes. To support our global customer base, we run 
uh, we run our Integrate with over 500 cloud-based applications in support of over 400 contracts. Our applications and service portfolio is as varied as our customers are. From frontline contact center representatives, senior business leaders, technical architects, project managers, service desk agents, cloud engineers, each has need for access in a secure and auditable way to resources they need to be productive. To achieve this, Maximus requires a solution for end user compute that is scalable, compliant, and secure. We began our cloud journey in mid-2018 when we adopted a cloud-first strategy. This holistic strategy didn't just focus on getting out of our bricks and mortar data centers, but was structured to help us achieve technological flexibility needed by our numerous customers. We began using Amazon Workspaces primarily, primarily within the IT organization and found that the platform allowed us to adopt a flexible work remote model that is really desired by a lot of our specialized technical staff and provided protection for the data that we are trusted to host by our customers. It became clear to us that not just IT could benefit from this. We established a milestone to grow our Amazon Workspace usage uh, to an additional 3,000 non-IT users. Getting them, the business on the platform was very important to us. And part of the goal was to show the value of the end user compute virtualization to our business leadership. And then COVID arrived in early 2020 and brought with it multi-country uh, mandates to reduce or remove on-site staff from our offices across the globe. With the native Amazon Workspace's fast scaling capability, we made the transition to work at home for 20,000 users between April and May of that year. We continued to see steady growth in our workspaces consumption month over month, and at our peak in May of 2021, we were running over 46,000 active workspaces. Today, we maintain around 20,000 users on the platform uh, performing their day-to-day -day work job. Like any journey, we have encountered some challenges. I expect that some of the challenges that we've faced, many of you also faced in your companies and in your daily uh, roles and responsibility. Some of them were customer driven and some of them were internal. With our broad customer base, we ran up against non-compliant applications, aggressive customer uptime SLAs, multiple system logins and more. In IT, we knew virtualization to be a value, uh, to be a value add to us, but our business staff was struggling at times to, uh, to understand how to get the most out of this new virtual workstation technology that we provided to them. One business value add we identified was that end users could connect to their company issued hardware or access workspaces from their company laptop or desktop or thin client, but even more so, we gave them the flexibility to connect from non-company managed assets or customer assets or even subcontractor assets. This was a real win for Maximus and for our business units because we no longer had to provide hardware to every agent that worked for us. We had the flexibility to bring on external supplemental resources anytime we needed. We encountered challenges in tracking the financials of such a large workspace deployment for proper internal and customer billing. That was a big challenge for sure. And we were required to look at our existing processes within IT and business ops and understand how this cloud journey mandated a new way of thinking. With input from our service desk team, our VDI operations organization, our cloud engineers and end users, we built out a tool called Maximus Cloud Factory. Cloud Factory is a purpose-built workspaces management platform that is used to address many areas of opportunity we identified and it's built upon the Amazon automation baseline functionality. We implemented profile and directory tagging to achieve accurate usage and financial reporting. This made our CFO happy, which made, was a win for all of us. Uh, using Amazon Workspace's platform architecture, we established a resiliency model across our multiple accounts. Now I'm gonna add a little bit of technical verbiage that I am very grateful to my VDI operations team for providing to me. 
We built in four regions with 86 directories to host our virtual workstations. We simplified our model down to three base images, Win10 WSP, Win10 PCOIP for thin client support, and Linux. We created, uh, we, we created and populated over 600 active directory security groups across 185 Maximus business unit segments to simplify app provisioning through 80 security group based automation. To make our end users' lives easier, we developed and deployed a simple, user-friendly web portal that provides one place to go for both self-service and to engage tech support when needed. The Amazon Workspaces multi-region resiliency solution announced just moments ago uh, he, uh, brings the new capability for automated failover, and we are in testing for a production rollout. We are excited to partner with AWS. Thank you for allowing us to be part of that. AWS took the time to understand us and develop a strategy that we could deploy successfully. They supported us as we put into practice what we learned to address our business needs. Because of this partnership, we were successful in the creation of our Cloud Factory and its adoption by our end user and technical teams. AWS engineers and developers worked with us on product enhancements, uh, product enhancements and connectivity improvements and brought in subject matter experts for us to help resolve issues that we couldn't solve on our own. They even provided important insights and supported our in-house development on the AWS platform. We now have greater flexibility to meet our rapidly changing business needs. Uh, since rolling out Cloud Factory, we have seen workspaces related uh, technical issues drop by 60%. Our end users' jobs are easier with a self-service option, and they now have a quicker path to support from technicians if needed. Our technicians are now more effective with streamlined troubleshooting processes. All of this has led to customer SAT levels, and to improve customer SAT levels, and we are able to let our contact center agents and our business teams focus on supporting our customers. One major ask from the business uh, well, from our business ops teams was for the highest quality bi-directional video and audio that was available. To achieve this, we've transitioned from PCOIP to WSP as our standard protocol for workspaces. High availability with defined RTOs and RPOs are part of all of our BCDR plans. And now with multi-region resiliency capability, we can define this as needed for each of our customers. As with all of you, I'm sure, security and privacy are always requirements, and Workspace's flexibility of configuration enables us to show ongoing compliance. My personal experience at Maximus and in the communications, financial, and government services sectors that I have worked in has helped me to distill my strategy for learning and growing down to a simple guideline. Technology, innovation, and growth in service to business operations and my customer is key to success. By listening and learning from them, technology teams will drive greater customer satisfaction and overall company growth. Thank you for letting me speak with you this evening, and back to you, Hassan. Thank you, Wiley. Um, so, we just shared a, a bunch of announcements today, but that was not just the rest of our year. So uh, we actually uh, launched more than 50 features across our services, whether that's across Workspaces Web, Workspaces, or AppStream, or in the protocols world. Uh, so I have a slide which uh, has a lot of features there, um, uh, but all of them are available on Workspaces. Uh, we expanded to many different regions. We're going to continue uh, expansion. Um, but essentially, uh, we believe that our job is not done. We believe that the workforce that our customers serve is always going to change as things change or situations change or as new innovation comes into the picture. Um, and that is the core reason why we work so closely with our customers to uh, both plan what we should do next, as well as to go a little bit deeper into how we should uh, actually build a feature. Uh, so showed some features from uh, our workspaces, and then there are some features on AppStream that we launched. Um, similar things over there, but I wanted to point out to two key ones which are my favorite. 
um, personally. One is the um, uh, session scripts for customization of the session. Um, and that's a very powerful feature uh, where, when we talk about this uh, selective persistent model that um, even though the AppStream instances are per use instances, so they get thrown away once a user logs off, uh, the need to customize uh, it to the company standards or to the user's liking is still there. Um, and the session script, uh, Session script customization actually customizes the session in runtime as the user uh, requests an uh, AppStream instance. Super powerful. You can um, put whatever scripts you want to run uh, to kind of fine tune that session uh, to your liking. Uh, the second one that I wanted to mention here is um, Elastic Fleets, um, which essentially um, takes all the management uh, heavy lifting away from admins. So this is um, automated uh, or fully managed uh, fleets that we manage internally through our infrastructure as a code. Um, and you as uh, admin can focus on the end users. Similar to workspaces, we expanded to many different regions on AppStream. And uh, uh, that is going to continue as we expand our footprint globally. Um, with that, that's all the new announcements for today. But we have a big track at uh, AWS reInvent this year. Uh, we have about 19 different sessions happening uh, through the course of this week. Um, we have talks from uh, Munir Mirza tomorrow. He's going to talk about the future of workforce. Uh, we have talks about security postures. We have talks about um, management of uh, end user computing services. Um, and a lot of uh, different uh, chalk talks uh, to go deeper into uh, some of the uh, technical um, uh, features and complexities. Um, we also have a lot of works, uh, workshops as well as builder sessions where uh, you can get hands-on experience uh, uh, to work with some of our uh, solution architects. Um, and, and really ask them questions uh, and try it for yourself uh, so that you're well uh, equipped and prepared to go um, build those um, uh, same workloads in your um, respective company's environment. Um, with that, uh, we have some more QR codes. But uh, these QR codes are um, going to talk about one of the most important things, uh, we have an end-user computing uh, reception happening on Wednesday at 6 p.m. Um, this is going to be, um, I believe, in Venetian um, or, or Encore, I think. But uh, follow that address. Um, it is uh, going to be fun. We're going to have uh, everybody from our team there. Uh, we are going to have a lot of customers, a lot of partners there. So it's a social gathering. Please do come and uh, enjoy a drink with us and get some food. Um, that link over uh, at the bottom is uh, really uh, all of our sessions, which um, I shared earlier. Uh, but you can also go into your uh, reInvent portal and uh, just search EUC Talk Track, and you're going to get all of those sessions in one place. <laughs>